right now in Pennsylvania, in Florida, in many other states, North Carolina, Georgia, campaigning. When I look at the economy, I don't see it through the eyes of Mar-a-Lago. I see it through the eyes of Scranton, and that's not hyperbole. Secretary Mayorkas has invited this catastrophe into our cities and our states. Impeachment should never be used to settle a policy disagreement. Talk about awful precedents. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. Let's start with a quote. It's a travesty of a mockery of a sham of a mockery of a travesty of two mockeries of a sham. No. Former President Trump did not say that about his criminal trial in New York City, where jury selection entered its second day, though he might have. No. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer did not say that about impeachment articles against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, hand delivered this afternoon by House Republicans, though he might have. And no, Supreme Court justices did not use those words to describe the use of a law written about the collapse of an energy company, Enron, to prosecute January 6th rioters, though some justices genuinely appeared uncertain that law was being fairly applied. So, what is a sham? Paying to kill or create tabloid stories during a presidential campaign and then trying to hide the evidence or turning those actions into a felony. What is a mockery? Impeaching a cabinet secretary over policy differences or an immigration policy that has, by any measure, created more hardship, chaos and uncertainty for migrants, border communities and lately big cities. What is a travesty? Lying about a verified and legal presidential election prompting a riot to block the peaceful transfer of power? Or using a law about documents and finance to punish some capital rioters for trespassing? It seems that all at once we are testing our definitions of justice, of precedent, of what, a law, what laws apply and how, and more to the point, how we punish, who we punish, and why. You know that line we started with about a travesty of a mockery of a sham? It comes from a 1971 movie called Bananas. It's about an American, a New Yorker, in fact, who quite comically becomes the leader of a mythical banana republic and is later tried for being disloyal to America. It was a satire of its time when funny people spoofed our legal and political system, not as now, when so many legal and political things look and feel bananas, but hardly anyone is laughing. Speaking of New York, that's where we begin today. Robert Costa and Katrina Kaufman are both covering the Trump trial. Katrina, much was made yesterday about Trump's demeanor and his attentiveness. Any observations today about how attentive the former president was or was not on this day? Yes, yeah, so earlier, we really think we caught him napping again, um, on and off, and then he was kind of bringing up the juror question sheet to look at that and then nodding off. But just now, he was really watching these jurors who were being questioned and, you know, really trying to see who might be judging him in this case, in addition to the people who have already been selected. Robert, uh, in addition to all the things that you gleaned today, what are your observations now two days into this process, which we have never seen before play out in American legal or political history? Well, to give you a sense of how it was uh, here in, in New York, in Lower Manhattan, yesterday, Major, a lot of protesters, anti-Trump protesters, pro-Trump protesters, curious onlookers, a ton of NYPD in their blue uniforms. Today, very few pro protesters. It was almost like a quiet part of the city. Uh, the, yes, Secret Service personnel were there, but New York was going about its business. It's not like New York lost interest, but it's clearly evident that people are going on with their lives, not enthralled to the jury selection of this trial. And I had the chance to speak with the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, today. And I said, Mr. Mayor, how are you going to handle the lack of protesters today? And he said, you know what? We're going to reduce the size of the footprint of the NYPD here, have it adjustable. So if there's a high profile witness, maybe they have more police in the street. But on a quiet day like today, where it was all about jury selection, he said New York is going to be flexible and shrink that security footprint, not in terms of making it less safe, but not having all these police officers just standing around. And Katrina, what can you tell us to the degree we know it about the schedule going forward? So for the jurors who were selected so far, the judge told them that they should expect to come back on 
Monday at 9.30, potentially for opening arguments, but that could change. Tomorrow we're off, and then the rest of this week is going to be spent vetting remaining jurors because we still need another 12. There's going to be 12 jurors total and then about six alternates chosen for this trial. And Katrina, under what conditions will those jurors, once selected, operate? So this will be an anonymous jury, and E. Jean Carroll was as well, but it's interesting that they're doing this because this is usually reserved for mafia and gang cases. And the lawyers do know the jurors' identities, but the public will not, and the jurors are also not supposed to reveal them to each other. And Robert, to the point you made a moment ago about day two having less crowd interest than day one, do you think that in any way the way this trial continues to play out and if it does follow that day two pattern as opposed to day one where this is basically a methodical procedural legal process, some of the political atmospherics might drain away from the former president, which he has so skillfully used, and I don't say that as an editorial, that's just a straight up observation based on the year that's already transpired, do you think some of that might drain away from the former president? My assessment as a reporter, uh, frankly, is no. And here's why. You know, on television sometimes, maybe even on CBS, sometimes old TV shows are revived, brought back. They have a revival uh, of some sorts. Well, what we're seeing here is a revival of a, a certain time in Donald Trump's life, the 2016 campaign. And the cast of characters from that episode of his life are going to be coming down to Lower Manhattan as witnesses. Hope Hicks, his high-profile former communications advisor, Michael Cohen, the former pick fixer, Stormy Daniels, David Pecker with the National Enquirer, at least formerly of the National Enquirer. All of these people might be called as witnesses, expected to be called as witnesses. Those won't be quiet days in New York, even though it's a quiet day today. And Robert, also, this case is sometimes summarized as a hush money case, but it was made clear yesterday in some of the opening statements, this is a little bit broader than that. It's about not only killing stories, but planting stories and having it influence the 2016 campaign. Did that strike you as something broader than maybe it's been shorthanded or in its more compressed description? Well, it all depends on whom you ask, Major. For example, that's how many of the prosecutors here, including the district attorney of Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, see the case. What's notable, though, is that Bragg is not prosecuting Trump exactly on those charges, that he was part of a criminal scheme. But he was saying, and he's saying, in a sense, with this prosecution, Trump made hush money payments with criminal intent to be part of a criminal scheme. So he's not prosecuting the scheme of killing all of these stories through the National Enquirer and different payments, but he's using that as a reference point to put together what would usually be a collection of misdemeanors into felony charges because he sees broader criminal content to your question based on what Trump's intent was here was to participate in felonies in his view that were part of a broader scheme, but he's not prosecuting on the scheme itself. That's just a notable thing to remember here. It's a little complicated legalese, but at the end of the day, this is about hush money payments, but it's about the context of hush money payments as well. Robert Costa and Katrina Kaufman, thank you very much. Of course, we will rely on you throughout this proceeding in New York and thereafter. Thank you again so very much. President Biden is, as you might expect, hitting the campaign trail, touting today his tax policies. The swipes the president and Pennsylvania's Democratic governor took against former President Trump. That's next. You are streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. President Biden was in his hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania, pitching his tax plan. The president argued, as he has before, that everyone needs to pay their fair share. And my plan calls for a minimum federal income tax of 25 percent, just 25 percent on billionaires. Well below the top rate, but fair, and they can afford it. Our Nancy Cordes is covering the president's trip. That means she is in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Nancy, great to see you. Walk us through the plan as was outlined by the president today. 
Well, Major, we knew that the president was going to focus heavily on, on creating a contrast between his tax plan and former President Trump's tax plan. It is the day after tax day, after all, uh, when most Americans uh, have, have now filed their taxes. And basically, he made the case that he doesn't want to raise taxes on anyone who is making less than $400,000 a year, but that he is going to ask billionaires and some corporations to pay more. All of that was no surprise. What did come as a surprise, however, uh, Major, was another argument that the president kind of unveiled here. You know, Pennsylvania is a really important battleground state. It is the biggest battleground state. He won it by just over one point four years ago. And he seemed to be making the case today uh, that he is one of them, not only because he grew up in Scranton, uh, but, but when you talk about values, that he shares Pennsylvanians' values and Donald Trump doesn't. And he brought up Mar-a-Lago, the president, the former president's uh, Florida home in Palm Beach, at least a dozen times in his speech. He kept saying Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Lago, uh, trying to create this contrast between his humble roots and the former president's wealth, essentially seeming to try to make the case in this key state and in this city, which is really known for its blue collar background as a, an iron and coal town, making the case, I'm one of you and Trump isn't. You also spoke to Pennsylvania's Governor Josh Shapiro, a uh, eager Biden surrogate about former President Trump's recent visit to Pennsylvania. Walk us through that conversation. Well, it's really interesting. We, we touched on a couple of topics, but uh, perhaps what was most notable was when I asked him about former President Trump's visit to this state over the weekend. Uh, Trump got a lot of attention and some mocking, frankly, on the late night shows for a, a riff that he went on about the most famous Civil War battle that was fought here in Pennsylvania, the Battle of Gettysburg. And as you know better than anyone, Major, uh, the former president likes to go on uh, unscripted riffs during his campaign speeches. Sometimes those riffs are more successful than others. This was kind of an odd one. He said, um, I'll just quote a little bit of it here, that Battle of Gettysburg, it was so much and so interesting and so vicious and horrible and so beautiful in so many different ways. Gettysburg, wow. Uh, and so I asked the, uh, the current governor of Pennsylvania what he thought about those comments. Take a listen. The former president was in your state this past weekend. He had some interesting comments about the Battle of Gettysburg. What did you make of the way he described it? This guy is clueless. He's clueless about Pennsylvania. He's clueless about American history. He's someone who doesn't show any respect for our soldiers, any respect for those who came before him, any understanding of whose shoulders that he is seeking to stand on as the next commander in chief. He's a guy who's looking out for himself, who doesn't have an appreciation for American history or the direction that we need to take America in. One that has more freedom, not less. One that is more prosperous for the middle class, not less. As you mentioned, Major Shapiro is a vigorous supporter of President Biden. He's someone who may have his own presidential ambition someday. Of course, he's going to take the opportunity to uh, slam Trump for his comments here in Pennsylvania. But uh, but but he did it with uh, a, a lot of uh, a vigor in our conversation, uh, again, seeming to echo the the theme that, that President Biden was expressing here on the campaign trail today, that that Trump is, is not in step with Pennsylvanians and their views and values. Nancy, you're at the White House all the time. You know that it is a parlor game for Democrats to parse the president's reelection messaging, how effective it is or isn't. Well, some of that parsing last week came from the former White House chief of staff, Ron Klain, who said the president talks too frequently about bridges and not enough about other economic issues. I gather you talked to Governor Shapiro about that as well. <laughs> I did, especially because Governor Shapiro is uh, sort of known for the fact that he spearheaded the effort to get a, a critical overpass that's part of I-95, this major corridor that runs up uh, the Northeast, uh, back and, and, and rebuilt after a fire brought it down uh, at the very start of his governorship. And so I asked him what he thought about that very unusual criticism for someone that uh, President Biden is quite close to, his former chief of staff, 
Ron Klain. They go back decades. But Klain basically said he needs to stop talking so much about bridges and infrastructure. He needs to start talking more about kitchen table issues that uh, that Americans are facing. Take a listen. The president's former chief of staff said the other day that he's spending too much time talking about infrastructure and standing at bridges um, and, and that it's just too vague of an issue for many voters. They don't feel it uh, intrinsically, the, the, the benefits yet from that infrastructure law. You're someone who is known. Uh, one of the big feathers in your cap is getting that um, overpass rebuilt so quickly. How big of an issue do you think it is for voters? Well, I can tell you. When I-95 collapsed, a road that takes about 200,000 cars and trucks every single day in Philadelphia, all up and down our eastern seaboard, it disrupted the flow of traffic. It disrupted families. The experts told me it would take months to repair. We got it reopened in just 12 days because of our partnership with President Biden, because he was there for us. So he thinks it's a potent issue, Major, but I got to tell you, uh, from what we heard from the president today, it sounds like he has gotten the message that Ron Klain was putting out there. Uh, let's talk about infrastructure today and a lot of sort of Clinton-esque, I feel your pain, I understand what you're going through, and I want to make it better. With the evolution of the messaging, Nancy Cordes and Scranton, thanks so very much. Supreme Court is taking a closer look at the law used to prosecute Donald Trump and hundreds of January 6th rioters. Our Scott McFarland covered today's hearing. We'll have a look at how that ruling could affect these cases. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments today in a case that may impact hundreds of Capitol riot defendants and possibly former President Trump. The justices are taking a closer look at the scope of a federal obstruction statute used to prosecute many of those cases, but not all. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland covered the argument at the Supreme Court today. Scott, summarize the legal question and your impressions of today's arguments. Very little discussion of rioting or rioters, no discussion of Donald Trump. This focused on one of the charges brought against 350-plus January 6 defendants, and against Donald Trump in his 2020 election conspiracy special counsel case. That charges obstruction of an official proceeding. You see there, roughly one in three or four of the defendants faces that charge. Prosecutors have argued successfully over the past three years that these defendants obstructed the official electoral count on January 6th. But one of the defendants, a former police officer charged with being part of the mob, successfully appealed, saying... That charge doesn't quite fit. That charge was created after the Enron scandal in 2002 and is more suitable for financial crimes or the destruction of documents, not for official congressional proceedings. The Supreme Court took up the matter today and with a series of 90 minutes of questions showed its concern that maybe this charge is too broad and not applicable in January 6 cases. Here's the bottom line, Major. If the court strikes down this charge before it finishes its business in June, dozens, if not hundreds, of defendants could have charges dropped, prison terms reduced, or their cases further delayed or reviewed. It's just going to bottleneck an already saturated courthouse and release some inmates early. And there's an important distinction where former President Trump is involved, as I understand it, Scott, because... Prosecutors in that case say that the fake electors does fall more cleanly into this document obstruction process. True? If they're arguing this is a document crime, not a mob attack, well, Donald Trump's allegations are a document crime, partly. That there were false paperwork submitted or false electors that were attempted to be submitted on January 6th. So the special counsel has been bullish, saying no matter what the court rules here, I'm going to plow forward with what really is two different charges, Major. Obstruction of an official proceeding against Donald Trump and conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding against Donald Trump. But you can just feel it in the air. If this court goes against this charge, you just sense it's going to delay things further. And that case is already on a knife's edge if they want to get the trial in before November. It's got another topic, the future of Ukraine aid. I spoke yesterday with Ro Khanna, California Democrat, about the possibility that Speaker Mike Johnson could bring to the floor something akin to a loan to Ukraine, not direct aid. 
I asked if you would support it. Let's take a quick listen. What is your attitude about something Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, has talked about, which is a loan to Ukraine as that, opposed to aid? Better than, better than nothing. I mean, I mean, if that's the only thing we can get, let's move in that direction. I mean, I think from my understanding of talking to uh, the people at the State Department, at the NSC, we need the aid. The loans aren't going to be enough. Scott, what is the status of Ukraine aid and the protections or lack of protections around the future of a Speaker Johnson speakership? Really, this seems to be an opportunity for the Speaker to find a way to satisfy his further right, hardliner Republican conference members who don't want to fund Ukraine, while also managing to get the aid through with Democratic votes and the votes of other Republicans. This is a way to do it and get it back to the U.S. Senate. The Senate does seem to have an open mind, but they've already put forward their own bill that funds Ukraine, funds Israel. So this could cost time, could cost the Speaker his job. Scott McFarlane on Capitol Hill, as always, we thank you. That does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. You are streaming CBS News.